Good morning. Welcome to Tuesday, and I hope your day is already going well. By the time you um, flip on a video or look online, I hope you've looked at God's Word and taken some time to talk to Him. I'm going to be uh, flipping through quite a bit of Bible this morning just for a few minutes. Uh, Genesis chapter 12. I've been telling some stories about um, history of uh, different famous martyrs and uh, stories of hymns that were written. Uh, great hymns of the faith. And uh, today, um, many of you, you know, you've heard me preach enough, you know pretty well the story of how I got saved and decisions that were made. But um, looking at the scripture, I want to just say a little bit about my Christian life, why I made the decisions I made. And again, um, no credit to man. There is a sovereign God, and uh, there is a God who who oversees in the affairs of men. And, and God doesn't look at life like we do. And, and sometimes God uniquely calls people. Uh, you know, the story of Gideon. Where was Gideon when this great general was called? He was hiding, threshing out some wheat from the enemy, trying to get enough food to feed his family. And you know, the angel shows up and says, Hail, hail thou, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon looks around and says, Who are you talking to? Um, you know, it's not all General George Pattons who grew up as a child re, re, uh, replaying famous battles of civil war with gray and blue toy soldiers. And, and sometimes God just does things. And, and I hope you all understand that it's the mercy of God that we're not consumed. Uh, Lamentations tells us it's just God's mercy. None of us deserve his goodness. None of us are worthy of his favor and uh but in genesis 12 we'll start here and uh genesis chapter 12 god calls a man named Abra abram a b r a m he was in uh, where babylon is ur of the chaldees way to the east several hundred miles across saudi arabia from where now modern day israel is and he called abram and it says now the lord in genesis 12 1 had said to abram had said, so it's already been done, this is past tense, um, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation. There's a lot in there. It's the Abrahamic covenant that was repeated to Isaac and Jacob. And, um, but the point here is when God was preparing to create a nation for himself, the very beginning of it, he had to call somebody out. He called Abram to leave and to take Sarah and for Abram and Sarah to leave their family, leave their home, leave their security. And God does a lot of calling out in the Bible. If you look at scriptures, I've scribbled just a couple of notes here and we're going to just scrib uh, jump through the Bible. But if you're right here, Genesis 12, if you don't have a cross reference, this Bible, I've got a couple of Bibles here at the office, and neither of them have any notes except what I put in, just how it happens. I don't think I'm smarter than anybody else, but you might write in your in the margin of your Bible there, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews is uh, Hebrews 11 is talking about these great people of faith in the past, and in Hebrews 11 and down at verse 8, he talks about God calling Abraham out. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place that he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. Now, it's interesting that um, God used that word out twice in this verse. And back over in Genesis chapter uh, 12, he calls, the Lord called Abraham, get thee out of thy country. He could have said, Abraham, leave your country. He could have said, Abraham, I've got a new place for you to leave. But but there's words that God uses. And God is not at a loss for words. He's got all the languages in the world mastered. And God has got all the vocabulary and all the dictionaries mastered. And when he chooses to use the word out here, and then in Hebrews 11, 8, to use it twice, so we got the word out three times in reference to Abraham. He wanted him out of that country. He wanted him to leave. He wanted him out. Follow me. If you look over um, to the uh, book of 
Exodus chapter 32. And you know the story, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph sold into slavery. Uh, 400 years pass. Moses is born and he leads the children of Israel out. There's the plagues and he goes across the Red Sea and the Mount Sinai, the commandments are given. And he led Israel out of Egypt. And so God led Abraham out of his home. And then for whatever reason, God brought Israel, Jacob is his name changed to Israel, and his 12 sons and one daughter and their family, 70 of them, down to Egypt. Leaves them there and to prosper and to grow into a couple of million people. And then God calls them out of Egypt. And there's a little statement, until the fullness of the Amorites. He was given the people in the land of Canaan a chance to repent. He was giving them time to change, giving them time to turn from their wickedness. And when they don't, uh, all right, you've crossed the line. God calls Israel out, says, I'm going to give this land to the, the children of Israel, um, and uh, they're going to wipe you out. And a lot of other doctrines in there, but uh, God calls them out. Well, on the way, they leave Egypt, they cross the Red Sea, they get to Mount Sinai, Moses and Joshua up there getting the commandments. Down below is Aaron, Moses' brother, who's kind of like the assistant overseeing everything. Moses and Aaron and Miriam, their sister, Moses and Aaron are, Aaron are brothers. Miriam's a sister, the older sister. She's the one who found, um, who saw Pharaoh's daughter pick up Moses from the, the bulrushes and said, would you like me to get one of the uh, Hebrew women to nurse the baby? And, and she's the big sister's the one who arranged all that. So she was, you know, a few years, maybe six, eight, ten years older than Moses. But uh, they're all sort of the ones that held up in esteem. When we get to uh, Exodus chapter 32, and Moses and Joshua come down from Sinai, come down the mountain, and they hear, it says, they heard, um, Mo Joshua said, it sounds like a war in the camp. So picture this, it sounded like war. Uh, noise and screaming and fighting. And Moses says, no, it's not the noise of them that strive or the noise of them that are overcome, the mastery. Somebody's getting mastery over them. He said, but the noise of them that do sing. So uh, think about music that sounds like the noise of war, all right? And uh, this is your first reference to rock music and the world's music. And uh, this is all in Exodus Chapter 32 in the verse 17, when Joshua heard the noise, he calls it noise, of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it's not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise, there again the third time the word noise is used in these two verses, the noise of them that sing do I hear. And... Uh, the story, Moses had been up there for 40 days and the people were stirring and they're scared. And remember, they, they'd been slaves for 400 years and all these plagues had happened. And it was all, this was a big confusing mess, kind of like people, uh, the shutdown of America. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of insecurity. What do we do? And um, and uh, Aaron had um, had the people bring him their earrings and necklaces and melted it down in the fire. And he fashioned calves of gold. Well, why calves? Those are the Egyptian gods. They've been in Egypt for 400 years. Those are the gods they were around. There's not this spirit God up on the mountain that you can't see. And that said, don't have any images. Don't make any graven images. I'm a spirit. I'm not a statue. And men like statues. Men like things. Men like, you know, this is the the belt buckle of Moses, and this is the helmet of Joshua in battle, especially the religious Catholic and the European old dark ages, they loved relics. And this bone is a, you know, is a leg of, of the grasshopper that John the Baptist ate or whatever. And, uh, and, and men, men like things, men like tangible things. And God, John 4, 24, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so um, Aaron made these calves of gold. And, and let's go into the end of the story. Moses comes down, scolds them all, chews them all out. And if you get down to the, oh, down to the end there, um, 
um, verse 24, Aaron is explaining, and I said unto them, Aaron, the younger brother, the, uh, the, uh, not the senior person, not younger in age, but, um, he's the brother who was working under Moses. Aaron says to Moses, whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. And I listen to how he tells it. Doesn't it sound like a child explaining to the parent how they got in trouble? I cast it into the fire and there came out this calf. It was like magic. I had nothing to do with it. I just threw the gold in and this calf came out. Oh, he's a liar is what he is. And we got another lesson. Maybe I might do it tomorrow. Maybe I'll preach and use the whole lesson. But people who God called and, and people mess up. And good people do mess up. It's a reality. And uh, here's one of them. God called Aaron to help Moses. And now Aaron's just a lying, desistant pastor. Um, but it says earlier that um, um, Aaron made the people naked to their shame. Um, this is a uh, look at verse, um, uh, let's see. Back over to uh, verse 19. And it came to pass, he came nigh the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger was waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. He's the first guy to break all Ten Commandments in one day. Um, and he took the calf and and uh, that they made and burned it in the fire, ground it to powder, strewed it, strewed it upon the water, made the children of Israel drink of it. Well, a lot of drama there. Smashes the calves to dust. That took a while. I don't know if they were this big or this big, but he smashed them to dust, scatters the dust in the water, scoops the water, it makes the people drink it. <laughs> That's drama. And uh, it was, um, anyway, go back up to verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Uh, God, he's up on the mountain and he sends them down. These people are a mess. And uh, Moses in verse 21 said to Aaron, what did this people to thee thou hast brought so great a sin upon them and all this big mess? And, and it was just a, 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 the whole situation is a tragic story. Um, they, uh, they were, there was music that sounded like the noise of war. The people were naked and the people were dancing. And whether they were thoroughly naked or just called naked and wore what people were at the beach today, I have no idea. But the word naked is what was used. Now, in this story, God called Israel out of Egypt. But just because they came out didn't mean they didn't bring Egypt with them. And there's a big decision the child of God has to make. When you get saved, God calls you out of the world. God calls you. Uh, look over to 2 Corinthians, if you would, in your Bible. God calls you out of the world. The decision is how much of the world are you going to bring with you? God calls you to leave that old religion of yours. The question is, how much of that old religion are you going to bring with you? Or are you going to forsake that old religion? Are you going to just give yourselves uh, entirely to God? Um, 2 Corinthians 6, where we're going. When God saved me, and I'll stop uh, for a minute, but we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 6. God had been working on my heart for some months, and it was not a... Nobody knocked on my door, led me to Christ. I came to church. Friends that I went to school with, I'd been watching them, and they had something that I was drawn to. Um, I don't know even what it was. It's not like I saw them sitting around reading their Bible. The girls, two or three girls, my wife being one of them, everybody knew they were good girls. The guys were good guys. They weren't weird. Uh, they were in different sports. They were involved in different things at school and uh, music and different stuff, and they weren't freaks or outcasts. I didn't see them carrying their Bible to school. I think it would be great if they had. It wouldn't have bothered me. I was looking for something. And how I thank God that down in my heart, God put that drawing. Jesus said, no man can come unto me except the Father draw him. And, and I knew God was drawing me. So I was on our senior trip. That would have been May of 1975. On our senior trip, the first real clear-cut gospel began to come to me. We were on a senior trip in a motel room. A good friend of mine, he was a, a, he was a Christian. He was the one that eventually led me to Christ. And we were talking, and he began to share how our school counselor got saved, went to church and got saved. 
I didn't know what getting saved was. I just heard this going on, and it was at church that it happened. And um, I was not a bad kid. I never got in trouble with anybody, never got a ticket, never got in trouble at school. My mom's uh, in our church, and you could ask her. I never caused any trouble at home, and I wasn't perfect, obviously, but um, I pretty well wanted to do right. I wanted to please my leaders. And something in my heart, my parents put there, whatever, I didn't want to disappoint people that were over me. I didn't want to hurt people around me. Certainly didn't want to disappoint people who were my leaders. And um, so I heard about this counselor who got saved. He, the guy didn't explain what it was, but he basically told about it. But he never explained to me I was a sinner in need of a Savior and on and on. So that was May. Well, from May until August, so that was the end of May. So throughout June and throughout July, for the next eight weeks, off and on, we all had jobs. We worked, but we ran. We got together. A small town, 2,000 people, 200 kids in the high school. So there's only a handful of people our age who fought like one another, friends. And and I remember one night we were out at a, uh, we were driving one of our friends to work in a place called High and Palm. It was a tiny little road, 20 or 30 miles out in the middle of nowhere. And I mean way out. Our town was in the middle of nowhere. But you go to the end of the road past the middle of nowhere, and that's where High and Palm was. And um, he worked at a horse ranch out there. And uh, he had to be there first thing in the morning. So we, we did whatever. I don't know what we were doing. I'm guessing it was a Sunday night after church, what I was thinking. But uh, this friend and, and the guy who worked at the ranch and I, uh, the two of us, we said, we'll give you a ride to, to work. So we drive down this dark, many, much of it, one lane road. And, and um, he said, hey, let me show you around, middle of the night. And uh, we're walking around the fields and the horses and the nice barns and everything. And, and, um, and they're looking at the course. You know what it's like when you go to a place where there's no light. And it's all the stars are so bright. And, and we're looking at the stars. And one of them said, wouldn't it be great if God just wrote in the sky a message so we knew what God wanted to tell us. And if we could read in the sky. And I didn't know it at the time, but God was speaking plenty from those stars to me. And I knew there was a God who put those stars there. And I knew there was a God who was worthy of getting to know. And a God who was worthy of us getting to worship. And and here, I'm still unsaved. Um, and by the way, God wrote something way better than the stars. He gave us his word. But those, I was around young men who just were open with their conversations of God and of Christ and salvation. And, and here and there, there was a couple of things that that uh, young man, uh, he went to college and we set part ways at school. He got married to one of my wife's best friends. And, and um, he ended up um, becoming an attorney and very successful in the world and but uh, one night we were doing something, I don't know what, and we were in his car. I have no idea what was going on, but he drove me home. And I remember I got out of the car, he got out of the car. We're looking at each other across the roof of the car. And he looked at me and he said, Bruce, are you saved? And I had no idea what being saved was. I'd heard the word from him, I'd heard it. And I'd still not been invited to church. And um, I said, no, I don't think so. And he said, you ought to think about it. Well, I'd been thinking about it. And... Um, and he got in the car and he drove off. He leaves me there thinking about it. And, uh, well, it was toward the end of summer. And uh, the, uh, the county fair at the end of August was in our town. And, again, I hung out with these guys. And, and I was drawing away from some unsaved friends and toward these Christian friends. And uh, we were at the county fair. Biggest deal in the county and right there in our town. And it was a tiny little fair. But it was the biggest thing there was in a town of 2,000. And we were walking around, there's these, you know, the exhibition booths with all kinds of the biggest turnip and the prettiest rooster or whatever. And we're just walking around and there were, one was booths selling this, selling that, advertising this. And there was something religious. I don't know what it was. Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, didn't matter what. Some religious thing. So I'm with these two guys. One's out of high school. He and I are still close. He goes to Pastor Johnson's church in Reading, my, uh, Mark Mario. And the guy who ended up leading me to Christ, Lanny. And me, so there's the three of us. We walk up this lady, and they start talking to her. And um, they pull out their New Testaments. Now, I'm not saved yet. They pull out their New Testaments, and they're witnessing that they're answering this. And here's an adult lady. We're, we're, in my mind, kids. We're just out of high school. And they're answering her questions with Bible verses. And they're asking her questions she couldn't answer. And I'm just standing there thinking, this is awesome. That a young person could know God and know God's word. And I'll tell you, the, the, the world had lost its desire for me. Uh, by this point, 
I had found what I was looking for, but I hadn't got it yet. It's like that pearl of great price. It was in the field, but I was having to sell out everything to go buy that field. And um, I sat there listening to them. And boy, it's like yesterday in my mind, I'm thinking, I want what these guys got. And there was no party. There was no college scholarship. There was no booze and girls. And there was nothing that mattered to me. God was calling me out. God was calling me to leave it all behind. And, and I had been dating a girl since my sophomore year in high school. So three years off and on, we've been dating. And uh, we'd even casually talked about marriage. She was going to college in Chico, California. I was going to Washington. But we were serious enough. And, and, um, and, and uh, but you know, at that point, every time I tried to get around these Christians, she, I could tell she a little pouty that, I'd, you know, I'm leaving her to go hang around them. And uh, I, remember, I remember thinking, I'm going to get saved. Whatever that is, I'm going to get it. And, and I don't mean this as a swear word, but it's what I thought. I thought, if she wants to go to hell, she can, but she's going alone. I am I want what these guys have got. And um, it was just shortly after that county fair, when I uh, the night before August 28th, when I called up my friend, and, and he happened to be at my wife's house, who was his girlfriend at the time. There was only so many cute girls in the whole town. And um, so I called him up. He came down to the city park and met me, and I, I said, I need to get saved. And, and that night, in the dark, he explained the gospel, and we bowed our heads, and I prayed and trusted Christ. And and I went straight to the lumber mill where my friend Mark Moravia was a scaler. He, he measured lumber and timbers on the full full logs on the way into the mill. And um, a world, <laughs> a different world than most of you who listen to this. But, but you know, when I got saved, I didn't care about that girl. I didn't care about liquor. I didn't care about college. I was going to college, but I didn't care. I didn't care. You know what? I just didn't care about much of anything. And I remember um, that week or so before, my closest friend that was not a Christian, his parents were gone. And he said, hey, come on over. Having all the friends over. He had a bunch, I don't know, a bunch, maybe 20 teenagers over there. And just hanging out, some outside the house, some in the house. And, um, and he had a case of beer. And I remember him walking around with that case of beer. And he, and I'm watching him and he got over where I was. I was sitting down with some people and I said, no, thanks. And I didn't, I didn't, I just said, no, it was not a big deal. And he looked at me, I'll never forget. His name is Jay, Jay Felch. And he looked at me and he said, they're going to get you, aren't they? You know, like the spacemen, <laughs> they're going to get you. And I thought, you know what? Yeah, I think they are. And suddenly that whole world had that left a bitter taste in my mouth. I wanted nothing to do with that world. I got up, walked outside, talked to a gal outside, actually a girl who had also, somebody had been talking to her about getting saved. I don't know who got it all going in that youth, young people's in that little tiny town, but there were several of my friends ended up getting saved after I did. And, um, and I walked out and I was done. I was done with the parties. I was done with the world. And, and I never was a partier, but I was, they were my friends, you know, hang out. But, and so I got saved, left for college. See, when God saves you, just like Abraham leaving Ur, the Chaldees, for, for Canaan, he didn't always tell you what's coming in the future, but he calls you to leave some things. And, and when God called Israel out of Egypt, he called them to leave Egypt and go to a land that he would show them. And, and they had brought along some of their old baggage. Well, you know, remember Abraham, he brought along Lot. He was supposed to leave everybody behind. He brought along Lot. Lot caused a lot of grief. And Lot was hurt. Lot lost his marriage, lost his, his children, a whole lot of tragedy in Lot's life. Abraham should have left him back in Ur of the Chaldees. But uh, he look over to it says 1 Peter chapter 2. I, I'm sorry, I never got you the verse in, in 2 Corinthians 6. In 2 Corinthians 6, in verse 17, he says, Wherefore, come out from all among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You see, you can get saved. By trusting Christ, putting your faith in him. But if you want to be close to him, you're going to have to come out of the world. He says the end of verse 17, and I, I will receive you, verse 18, and I will be a father unto you. You see, you can be saved, but like a runaway child, you can be out in the world and, and uh, you don't have that father relationship. But God wants it. And God has called us out of this world. First Peter Chapter 2, I've gone along a little long this morning, and that's why I didn't read any of these other stories. But 
1 Peter chapter 2 in your Bible. And I began reading my Bible. I had lived with a basketball in my hand. I put that basketball away. I wanted nothing but God. I was done. I worked. I made money. I had a car. I had a girlfriend. And she ended up getting saved. Um, and then we broke up. She wasn't wasn't right. But but uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye, you that are saved, ye are a chosen generation. Isn't that great? You're chosen. Number two, you're a royal priesthood. That Pope's got nothing on you. You are a priest of God. That Pope's probably not even saved. Telling the world you pray to Mary. There's no Mary praying in the Bible. Telling the world you worship statues and relics and bones of dead people and Places where somebody got a drink of water out of a drinking fountain, all that nonsense. How many how many pieces of the cross did they sell? And how many indulgences did that that uh, vile church of the dark ages uh, promote and sell? What a mess that whole thing was. We are a, a royal priesthood. Number one, chosen generation. Number two, a royal priesthood. Number three, a holy nation. Number four, a peculiar people. We're supposed to be different that ye should show forth the praises of him with called you, here it is, out of darkness into his marvelous light. God calls us out. And you shouldn't be the least bit afraid nor ashamed to walk out of that old life. You shouldn't be, see, the, the problem with young, young Christians, a lot of this young adult Christians in America today, and, and it's in not just today, it's in every generation, they love the world. They like the parties, the music, the concerts. They like they like that world. You see, they're kind of like Aaron with the golden calf. We want to be out of Egypt, but we still like the golden calf. We don't want to be slaves anymore, but we do like the dancing and the rock music. Um, God's called you out of that darkness into his marvelous light. I got saved on Wednesday, left for college on Saturday, and I had the world's music around. Our family had a lot of music. We I knew music from when I was a little boy all the way back from Hank Snow and Hank Williams and and uh, I mean, you could go, go all of the famous singers in the 50s and 60s. We had records of them, my parents. And I knew that I could sing some of the songs if you want a concert with a terrible voice. But um, um, a lot of that old music, big band music, from big band and Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey to Diana Shore, um, all, all the way up, uh, all that, uh, to, to, the 60, to the 70s music. I graduated in 1975. And, well, I got saved. And I come back that next year and some Christians invited me to a, a Christian concert. I've never been to a co Christian concert. So I go down uh, to Reading and they've got this big Christian concert and look around and people are standing and waving their hands. The music's blaring. The light show's going on. And, and I thought, man, I got saved out of this. And I walked out. I got saved out of that. Now, I don't know what those people got when they got Christ, but I got saved out of that world. I got saved out of the world of flesh and carnality and rock music and, and the casual beer drinking. I got invited to a, a college-age activity. The young people at a big church there in Northern California, uh, their college group, had a big college group at their church, several thousand, and in the church. And uh, and I, I was out at evening time after work. Somebody had a, a houseboat. A bunch of you got to go out on the lake and... And, and I'm, I'm walking up toward that boat. I'll never forget. And uh, I think my wife was with me. We were dating. I think she was with me. And there's a girl standing there with her bikini and a t-shirt. And she'd been swimming. And I walk up. And again, I won't even say just a short time. I never heard of, I've never, I couldn't tell you if the Bible said anything about proper dress or modesty or anything. And it does say a lot about it. But I could have told you. But I've been reading my Bible every day, every single day for that, by, by the hour. For a year. So this is the summer. I've been saved nine months or so. And I look at that girl and I think, that's wrong. That's not what Christians ought to look like. You see, God called me out of that. And our church is different. And our church will get attacked. And our church will be lied about. People get mad at our church. Well, you know, Aaron and his crap crowd with that golden calf, they didn't like Moses grinding that those cows up, making them drink it. Um, they the, this the, there's a there's a the call of God is to come out of the world. Come out of that immorality. Come out of the booze. Come out of the worldly parties. A guy came to our church some years ago, and, and I said, what brings you here? And he was saved. We talked a little bit. And, and he said, well, I'm sitting after church one Sunday afternoon with the pastor. We're drinking wine coolers. And, 
And I'm thinking, this is not Christianity. And I thought, you're dead right, it's not Christianity. They brought the world with them. They might have, I'm not saying they're not saved, but it's not what God called us to be. I don't want you to say this. God called you out of that world. Let's live differently. Not to get saved. You don't get saved by living differently. You get saved by the grace and mercy of Almighty God. But when he called us, let's, let's walk the walk. He's called me to get out of that thing. He's called you to get out of it. And uh, our church is weird. We're different. We're going to be different. As long as God gives me grace, we're going to be different. And uh, we're raising a generation of young people who are different. Many of them choose a more casual life. That's fine. I love them. Good kids. They come back. I'll love them. They don't come back. I love them. But if they want to go to a church more casual, I'm thankful for every church preaching Christ. I don't. What, whatever they do is up to them. But God called us to be out. God called us out of this old world. Have a great Tuesday. And hope it didn't throw your week off a little bit heavy for a Tuesday morning. God bless you. Have a great week.